In the lush and vibrant lands of the Creeks tribe, there is a rich history woven through time, telling the tales of remarkable women who have played integral roles in shaping their community. The story begins with the Creeks tribe living harmoniously in their ancestral lands. During this era, women were highly regarded for their wisdom and strength, serving as influential leaders and decision-makers within their tribes. They were known for their resilience, resourcefulness, and unwavering dedication to preserving their traditions. As time passed, external forces began to encroach upon the Creeks' territory. Settlers arrived with dreams of colonization, disrupting the balance that had been established for centuries. Despite facing numerous challenges and injustices at the hands of these newcomers, the women of the Creek tribe showed great courage and resilience. The Creek Indians were a confederation of tribes that belonged primarily to the Muscogean linguistic group, which also included the Choctaws and Chickasaws. The Muscogees were the dominant tribe of the Confederacy, but all members eventually came to be known collectively as Creek Indians. Polygyny and Adultery First, pregnant women, menstruating women, and warriors in preparation for hunts, battles did not engage in sex. These things involved strict rules because of their connection to blood, which the Cherokees understood to be the life and spirit. Personal autonomy for women was akin to modern, U.S. women, in that they were more or less free to hump whomever they chose, as long as it wasn't incestuous. Cherokee historian James Adair also understood Cherokee women to be allowed the honor of promiscuity, noting that there were no punishments for adulterous women. In fact, most Cherokee men wouldn't argue over adulterous women because it was deemed to be beneath them, Louis Philippe. Sexual encounters would, indeed, occur in the bean fields and other places of a relatively private nature. According to Charles Hudson's 1976 book The Southeastern Indians, drawing from James Mooney's ethnographic work, in general in the region a young man would send his mother's sister to speak to a young woman's mother's sister. The girl's mother's sister would speak to the girl's matrilineage about the idea, often without telling the girl. If the matrilineage liked the idea, they would send word back to the boy's matrilineage. However, although they arranged the marriages, the girl had final word, and her consent was required. Southeastern Indians' favorite places for sexual episodes were corn cribs, corn fields, and bin patches. Polygyny was widely practiced throughout the region, although the permission of the first wife was required. Divorce existed and could be initiated by either party. Cheating was frowned on and punishable among the Creeks a neighbors of the Cherokee, while the Cherokee allowed both women and men relative sexual freedom of lovers, although women could not marry multiple men or keep concubines. When a young man had chosen a girl he wished to marry he would kill a deer and bring an offer of deer meat to the home of the girl he was interested in. If she chose to marry him, she cooked the deer meat and offered it to him. If she rejected the deer meat, it was assumed to be a denial of this suitor. Cherokee were matrilineal, meaning children were not part of their father's family. This is a very foreign subject to most modern or Western people today. Your mother's brother was basically your father and the most important person in your life. In a way your biological father was just the person that happened to be having sex with your mother. Many cultures with this matrilineal kinship system do not recognize the role of sex in making babies. In Melanesia for example, they traditionally believed that the fertility of the ocean is what impregnated a woman and explained that children sometimes looked like their mother's husbands because the child will take on the form of those nearest to the mother while it was developing in the womb. I'm not sure if this holds true as much in Cherokee society however, as there were strict laws against incest, and they recognized marrying someone from your biological father's clan as incest, as well as from your mother's clan. The Cherokee people were divided into seven clans, wild potato, long-haired deer, blue wolf, bird, and paint. 
Every village was made up of representatives and households from each of these seven clans. So in theory, everyone would have five clans to choose from when choosing a husband or wife. The Creek Confederacy Most of the Creeks descended from groups living in six towns, Casita, Coweta, Arika, Kusa, Hoythal, War, and Takabachi, all within the confines of the future Alabama and Georgia. These groups most probably formed the Confederacy. Later, the Creeks established the practice of adopting conquered tribes and accepting bands fleeing from English, French, and Spanish attacks. By these methods, the Alabama, Cushata, Tuskegee, and Natchez Indians eventually became Creeks. The Creek Confederacy inhabited a large portion of what later became Alabama and Georgia. They, like other Muscogean tribes, apparently migrated to that region from the west in prehistoric times. The Confederacy was divided into two districts, the Upper Creeks, centered on the Coosa and Tallapusa rivers, and the Lower Creeks, residing near the Flint and Chattahoochee. In early historic times, the Creek population was variously estimated at 11,000 to 24,000, distributed among 50 to 80 towns and outlying villages. The Creeks divided their towns into White Peace or Red War classifications. White towns hosted councils for concluding peace, adopted conquered tribes, and enacted most laws and regulations for internal affairs. Red towns declared war, planned military expeditions, and held diplomatic councils. Although members of white clans were associated with peace, they were expected to fight during wars. Indeed, advancement in civil rank was largely dependent upon military achievement. The entire Creek population was divided into clans that cut across towns and families alike. Members of a particular clan were considered close relatives, even though they might have never seen each other before. Clan members had unlimited claims on each other's services because of the perceived kinship of clan members. Marriage within a clan was strictly forbidden. Clans varied in size and stature. For example, the Wind Clan had members in all of the towns of the Confederacy and enjoyed special privileges as an aristocratic caste. The Creeks traditionally prohibited marriage within one's own clan or freightry and one's father's clan. Parents or clan elders normally arranged first and sometimes subsequent marriages, giving their children only the right of refusal. Older individuals might exercise greater choice of mates. Little ceremony other than nominal gift exchange marked marriage. Newlyweds typically lived with the wife's parents for the first year or two, after which a separate house was constructed nearby. Adultery was severely punished, and women could be beaten and have their hair and ears or noses cropped, and men could be beaten senseless by their wives' female relatives. At the death of a spouse, the survivor entered a period of mourning during which he or she remained largely secluded and unkempt, cared for by the deceased female relatives. This period lasted for months for men and four years for women, though the deceased spouse's female relatives could shorten that period. At the end of the mourning period, the clan of the deceased was expected to provide a replacement spouse who could be refused by either men or women. Divorce was common and could be initiated by either party. Men became free immediately, but women had to wait until the next green corn ceremony. No stigma was attached to divorced persons. Except in cases of adultery, these practices continued into the early 20th century but were subsequently abandoned, though a preference for matrilocality still exists among social conservatives. Creek marriage and family. Traditionally, Creeks lived in nuclear family houses comprising two to four buildings around an interior courtyard. Houses were arranged in matrilocal extended family clusters and clan wards. Each household was economically independent, though some labor pooling and resource sharing existed within the extended family and clan. 
During the 20th century, the economic and social conditions produced trends toward dispersed nuclear family households. Some extended family clusters characterize more conservative rural communities, and three-generational families are common, owing to poverty and the prevalence of single mothers. Since the late 20th century, inheritance aboriginally inheritance passed from mother to daughter and mother's brother to sister son, though fathers could bequeath some limited property to their own children by public declaration. During the 19th century, the Creek Nation permitted general patrilineal inheritance but required public testament. Matrilineal inheritance remained the default rule until the 20th century, and the conflicting rules provided a major source of legal disputes. Since 1907, Oklahoma statutes governing intested inheritance have prevailed, though there is some tendency to ultimogeniture in actual practice. Socialization, aboriginally, mothers had primary responsibility for socializing children aided by their brothers and clan elders. These latter also supervised the education of boys from about five or six. Socialization was and is generally permissive, with ridicule and ostracism used to discipline the children. Clan uncles punished more severe or repeated infractions by scratching the arms or legs with a guard tooth or sewing needle. Since the 1930s, fathers have assumed a more active role in socializing children, along with other trends toward Euro-American practices. Maternal uncles often retain an active interest in socially conservative families. Economy, subsistence, the Creeks were farmers, raising maize, beans, squashes, and other crops by intensively farming the river levees, supplemented by hunting, fishing, and gathering. Several varieties of each of the major crops were raised. The Creeks maintained an infield outfield system with small garden plots near the houses and large town fields some distance away. Along the river levees, the women of each household individually farmed their infield fields. The town fields, which contained individual plots for each household, were worked by communally organized work gangs of men under the command of the town chief. The chief game animals were the white-tailed deer, raccoons, and turkeys. Men hunted primarily during the late fall and winter, October to March, with both communal drives and smaller parties. Men often left the villages for weeks or months at this time. Meat from these hunts was dried and smoked for future use. Men only hunted close to the villages during the agricultural season. Commercial activities, during the 18th century, the Creeks adopted cattle, horses, hogs, and chickens from the Europeans, along with a number of vegetable and fruit crops. They also became heavily involved in the European deerskin trade at this time and grew increasingly dependent on European manufacturers, particularly edged tools, cloth, and farms. The trade collapsed at the end of the 18th century, and some creeks shifted to selling cattle and working in intensive commercial agriculture. Intimate likes of creeks Beginning at puberty, boys and girls were allowed to court as they pleased and often had many suitors. The early French missionaries in the area, like Lejeune and Sagard, bemoan the sexual liberty that teenage Iroquoians enjoyed, provided the partners from of differing clans. Unfortunately, Mann has a fairly lengthy discussion analyzing a long song beginning on the bottom of page 98 which would have been quite useful for this discussion if it weren't almost certainly wrong. She's quoting Montaigne here, and Montaigne's famous savages were almost certainly 2p from the French Antarctic, southern coast of Brazil today, rather than any Iroquoian people. I figured I should mention that in case anyone else happens to read that portion of the book. Her description of Iroquoian courtship might still be accurate here, but it's erroneous to foist an Iroquoian interpretation on the love song. The late teens and early twenties was the time to start settling down. The clan mothers in charge of each longhouse set about negotiating arrangements for potential marriages. 
The young woman was consulted on which of her various suitors she preferred, but she was never pressured into a marriage unless she was pregnant and intended to keep the child, abortion and adoption were both options available to a woman when traditional contraceptives failed. Even then, her would-be husband would still be a suitor of her choice rather than necessarily the biological father. She was not obligated to name the father, though men regarded it as an honor to be recognized. Once the young woman named a potential husband, her clan mothers made the proposal to his clan mothers. Unless he was vehemently against the union, his clan mothers expressed their consent by presenting the woman's clan mothers with gifts. At this point the couple entered into a trial marriage that could last up to several weeks. For most of this time, the man lived in the woman's longhouse, though he would occasionally return to his own. The woman's clan mothers observed their interactions and sought to ensure their eventual marriage would be a long-lasting union rather than a temporary fling. If things went poorly for whatever, the woman's clan mothers returned the young man and the gifts he had brought along with him. However, if the young couple passes the clan mother's tests, they progress to a full marriage. The woman's longhouse prepares a feast and the celebration takes place in the man's longhouse. Afterward, the new husband and wife lived in the woman's longhouse and the man was thereafter under the authority of his wife's clan mothers. As it was the clan mother's duty to settle disputes among the residents of their respective longhouses, it was also their job to settle any marital problems that might arise between a wife and her husband which included forcing a divorce in circumstances including infertility, incessant arguing, domestic violence, ineptitude. Either partner might petition the clan mothers for a divorce voluntarily and would usually be granted one unless children were involved, in which case only extreme situations warranted a divorce. Children were the only real obligation of the marriage, and monogamy wasn't a necessary part of the arrangement. For men, a common extramarital affair might happen with a hunting wife, a woman who accompanied a hunting party into the countryside. Hunting wives were usually women who declined the usual societal roles of women and didn't want regular husbands, children, or clan motherhood. The wife often found her husband a hunting wife, so she wouldn't have to accompany him out on his long journeys herself. Women could enjoy extramarital relations themselves, and famously among the Seneca, they might choose to have multiple husbands. As for third-plus genders, that's not, to my knowledge, a thing among Iroquoian societies. I already mentioned the hunting wives defying the usual gender expectations of women, there were also men who became honorary women and served on the clan mother's council, usually as intermediaries between their councils and the men's councils. But such people weren't seen as outside the woman-man gender dichotomy. Third-plus genders are much more common west of the Mississippi than east of it. Creek's homosexuality Most native peoples were fairly open regarding sexuality. Homosexuality was also common, though some things I've read probably suggest that bestiality and pedophilia were looked down upon, stories making fun of those who lie with dogs and actual historical accounts of white men taking little native girls as wives and the tribe eventually snapping and killing the guy. Women were usually taught about sex as part of their puberty rituals, but I guess the men were probably assumed to have figured it out on their own. Multiple wives or husbands was allowed by law, though the average native person tended to only choose to have the one. I know the Aztecs actually had practicing prostitutes, who were marked with dyed teeth. Other than that, I am only aware of two unique exceptions. Women's virtue was fiercely guarded in the Pacific Northwest, though some coastal tribes did attempt to jumpstart trade by using their women as prostitutes to entice sailors to come to shore in their lands more often, and Inuits had a concept of men sharing their wives with close friends. Among the many variant sexual customs, some Plains tribes considered brothers equally entitled to their respective wives in their band, even if one was unattached. 
adultery would be discouraged in most tribes, with consequences dependent on tribal custom, i.e., ownership, personal matter, subject to mediation, etc., but incest was their strongest taboo, bringing death rather than mere expulsion from the band. Most tribes regularly mixed men and women between various bands, to enrich the gene pool, also encouraging the purchase or kidnapping of strangers for the same reason. Successful warriors hunters routinely had multiple wives, constrained only by their wealth, usually measured in horses. The Americas were a big, big place with hundreds of millions of people before the second European arrival in the 15th century. Some were quite accepting of all forms of sex, some others imposed their members a lot of restrictions. Some Plains tribes were very accepting of lesbian gay people marrying people of their same biological sex as long as they cross-dressed and fit certain jobs, for males it was usually a shaman or sorcerer of sorts, females were incorporated to the brotherhood of hunters and warriors. The Schemos had a form of permissible adultery wherein a man shared his wife, along with most of his best material possessions, to a most honored guest, expecting he'd be reciprocated later, a form of hospitality many in our society find difficult to understand or accept. The Mayans considered it a disgraceful thing for their unwed youth to engage in premarital sex. They didn't have a particular taboo against homosexuality, so nobles and wealthy fathers would buy a pretty male slave to be used by his son so as to relieve their sexual tension before marriage. For girls, well, they were simply guarded very closely to avoid them eating the cake before the wedding or worse, getting pregnant out of wedlock. On the other hand, the Aztecs had pretty strong rules against homosexuality, adultery, and raping a female of one of the conquered nations, all were punishable by death if found guilty on trial. Whether these were their original beliefs, having come all the way from their birthplace somewhere in modern us southwest, or part of Tlaxilal's religious reforms to make the Aztecs a more populous and warsome people is open to speculation. Premarital sex wasn't that much of an issue for Aztecs because a heterosexual couple starting to have regular sex were considered to having committed themselves to a form of marriage, even though they hadn't gone to a temple to receive blessings from any god's priest. On the other hand, any and all sins were forgiven if an Aztec person went to the temple of the Aztec goddess of truth, touched with one of its fingers the altar, with such finger take a bit and ate of the pinoli being ritually toasted in front of such altar, then confessed all of their sins to one of her priests at the place, the priest would latter produce a certificate of soul cleansing that legally made them cleanest and purest. There was no separation between church and state for them, and supposedly made them also accepted by the gods as saints and born again in a way. As such Aztec confession could only be done once in a lifetime, they usually did this only when they thought they were about to die for some reason or when they were really, really old. Interesting trivia, it's the same goddess who, should a running slave enter it with human excrement on one of their feet and touched with the other foot one of the columns in the presence of the priests, the slave was granted a certificate of liberty thus having gotten their freedom, I've never understood what was the religious significance of that ritual. Thanks for watching. Do like, subscribe and comment.